Thank you for staying with us. You're still on to the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to see what the national dailies are saying this morning in Off the Press. And joining us to review the papers is Gide Johnson. He's a chief lecturer at Nigerian Institute of Journalism and is joining us here from Lagos State. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank Good you morning, so sir. much. Good morning. All right, let's start with Nature News. And um, there's a small headline at the bottom which says, Federal Government Reaffirms Commitment to Achieving Food Security. Um, I'm sure because we all live in Nigeria, we know what the food prices are saying. The inflation has skyrocketed. But they're saying they are committed to achieving that food security. And I want to believe it's not just... Um, the access to food, it's also the pricing as well that people can afford this food that we're talking about. But I want to get your thoughts on this one. It's easier, it is easier said than done. Mm. If you look at the major, the bold, the major headline of the Nature, Nature News, you see that the Benue State Government has set up a, a panel to deal with farmer headers clashes. Yeah. I think in one of the, in one of the sidebar stories, uh, you have farmers, Epe, farmers protesting in Epe, mm. and then so basically, <clears throat> how does government want to achieve that policy statement of reducing the cost of living by dealing with the agricultural sector? I think it's larger than just making policy statement. It's about what they see in warfare. It's about putting the boot on the ground, and how do we put the boot on the ground? We ensure that there is safety and security of <clears throat> of farmers across the length and breadth of Nigeria. Where is the where is the agricultural corridor of Nigeria? If you look at the agricultural corridor of Nigeria, not even only limited to the agricultural corridor. If you interact and interface with people that are involved in agriculture, that are made investment in agriculture, they tell you the challenges they are facing. They are facing. So, <clears throat> government needs to ensure that the perennial problem of farmer headers clashes is dealt with the issue of bandits disturbing farmers from going to yeah. their their farmlands is is, is 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 dealt is dealt with the issue of unknown gunmen coming to chase traditional farmers away from their ancestral home because they want to have access to to the natural resources in their farmlands should be addressed beyond just making those statements or releasing press statements or granting press conferences and making policy statement on the page of newspaper. Those errors are gone. We just want action. Less of talk. Fully grow this economy is when we become self-sufficient when it, when it comes to food security. If a nation cannot feed itself, that nation cannot develop. And that's the basis. Because if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of need, in terms of the basic need of man, once you take care of it, and there's a particular saying in my local dialect, that once you take hunger out of it, poverty is over. Once you take hunger out of poverty, poverty is dealt with completely. And uh, you said it, the cost of living is very, very high. We have um, close to over 30 The model we, we spend on, on sustaining ourselves in terms of subsistence level is tied to food, water, and, 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 and shelter, and government needs to be, to, to, to be serious about this. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you even touched on the whole bandit, banditry thing, because you hear of people going to their farms and terrorists will just attack them, steal their land, tell them they can't farm. And then there's even so much more when you talk about the agricultural sector. They need... Um, they need mechanization, they need equipment. So obviously saying they're committed to food, achieving food security is one thing, but having those things in place, having the policies and you know all of the mechanisms needed is another. But I'm going to now go to this. Um, it says federal government seeks verifiable list of farmers in Nigeria. Now my question is why is, why like what exactly do they wanna achieve with this? Are there going to be maybe some form of palliative or support to these farmers that they're trying to verify. So if you are verifying these farmers, what is the need for this and what do they even get in return? Does it mean that you know food production is going to be 
surplus right now and all of the prices would, would you know just have a dip i think in the area of food security what government should, what the federal government should be much more concerned is providing um, security of lives and property and access to the farmland to the farmers that should be their major concern every other thing with respect to enumeration of farmers getting the list of the farmers distribution of fertilizers to the farmers interfacing or interacting with the farmers should be done by the local government and the state government those are somebody cannot be in abuja and want to enumerate the farmers in damatu or enumerate the farmers the man the 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 the, 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 the farmers the farmers in Makodi or Zak, Zak, Zakibiano. So, or those, those in Aitro in Oko State. So, as far as I'm concerned, we have over centralized a lot of things. And you have this centralization because people don't want others to have access to the fund. We should decentralize this process. That's my take. And that's why it has not, it has not really worked. It, how could um, someone in the Ministry of Agriculture in Abuja have an understanding or have where, where is the resources they are going to in fact they are going to spend much more resources on on logistics rather than spend more money in distributing to the farmers in order for them to have as palliative in order to 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 to, to sustain and, and 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 increase their productivity so sometimes you wonder well, whether it requires rocket science for people to understand that it is easier for 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 the air to perform its function and for the federal government is the head but where is we are the head? Let me use the illustration of the human body. Where the head is trying to do the function of the hand and the leg, it's it's the head will, will be misplaced. So as far as I'm concerned, this particular responsibility should be left alone for the state government and the local government. And that's why you have three tiers of government. These are yeah. the closest government to the people. So one one ministry of agriculture official cannot be in Abuja and have a clear understanding. You know how many how many hours it will take them. <clears throat> To even get to 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 the rural areas where you have where you have some of these farmers, even in some states, it might take you six to seven hours to get to some parts of some states. Right. Not to talk of if you are coming from Abuja, uh, well, we have what you have in Ministry. Of, that's why you have what you have in Ministry of Material Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, where people took flights to Kogi, where there's no airport mm. from Abuja. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's move to uh, Punch newspaper. Um, there are small headlines there on the punch newspaper. Lagos NBA yeah, protests. Tom. Yeah, because I threw a punch, you want to give me a punch? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Oh, okay. That is a very good oh, one. Oh, you want me to take you to the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs? There's a headline there. <laughs> no, let's but, try. Let's try. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> just, just uh, down there, we have uh, Lagos NBA protesters storm police headquarters over brutality against lawyers. I've been taking two protests at the same time. Widows of soldiers killed in 1992 plane crash demand compensation. That is 22 years after their husbands were killed. I don't know if there are legal frameworks that need to be surmounted before these people can be uh, looked at and given if they need to be given compensation or something. Because these people were not going on a private visit when this thing happened. And till now, 22 years later, they are only protesting before uh, the government can see them. It's in fact, it's in fact 32 years younger. It's 32, oh, 32 years. 32 years, sorry, 32 years, sorry. 32 yeah, years, yeah. 32 years down the line, they've not had access to any kind of compensation from the government. And you wonder where the level of patriotism of others that come after them would be. And we begin to question the patriotism of Nigerian armed forces. And then you are, you will, you'll have seen people in this, in, in the various welfare bodies of, of the Army, of the Navy, of the Air Force, um, were fleecing from what has been required for these people um, to take care of them. It's unfortunate that uh, uh, to serve our fatherland, um, it becomes, 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 becomes worrisome when you begin to see what you are seeing on the pages of newspaper. That years and years and years and years, decades after the kids, a child that is born, um after that that incident is already 31 years old today and it's unfortunate and that 31 year, what what the family has gone to they lost their loved ones and yet the nation is not able to take care of them it's it's rather unfortunate we hope those that are in authority now we, we are seed to, to 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 their request and they will meet up 
with their needs because it's important for those that have served this country to be properly appreciated. They don't even need to protest to get all of this thing done. If you go, if you do a thorough investigation, you might be shocked that some of the resources might, resources might have been allocated to this over and over time, and these resources might have gone into private pocket. Uh, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think that government needs to act promptly, and this particular issue needs to be dealt with um, appropriately. With respect to the protest by lawyers um, over the brutalization of, of lawyers by 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 police, uh, it's it's that's another unfortunate thing. I, I read the story, this this particular one, where yeah. the lawyer <clears throat> that went to to bail his client was was detained, brutalized by the police, and what really happened was that the police commissioner said, well. He has recalled the TPO and he has changed the TPO of that particular police station. It should not be only recorded, it should be prosecuted. That's the fact that you're a law enforcement officer does not give you the right to break the law. If you engage in in, in, in battery, if you engage, if you if you engage in assault, just by the fact that you are <clears throat> you are you are a security personnel, you will be prosecuted because the basis of the law is nobody's above, nobody's actually above the law. And I think that. That's why those that have advocated for some reforms, uh, judicial reforms, uh, police, community relations reforms, uh, it, it is very, very important. Uh, that's on the part of those that are. And we need an holistic approach. How often do we send police to training? That's another question you need to ask. How often do they go to training to have an interface on how to relate with people, to have an interface on how to relate with lawyers, to have an interface on how to even relate with 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 our with people that have been allegedly accused for one crime or the other. So it's important. It's important for us to, to do constant training and retraining, remodeling and remodeling of, 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 of people in security, in security agencies. You saw you saw the the salivant behavior of some of some military officers with respect to insulting the governor, the governor of Lagos State over over the arrest of 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 one, of one of them, and um, that's that's some people just felt that they are above the law. Not only those that are in police, even people that you have elected into public into public offices, they believe that they are untouchable and they can take the law into their hand. But the way to deal with that is to have an equal justice system, not a two-tier or three-tier justice system, a justice system that takes everybody equally. If you put on the uniform and you break the law, you face the consequences of your action. Simple. Well, I couldn't agree more. You have to face the consequences of your action. Okay, let's move over to The Guardian. And um, there's a small headline at the bottom, well, middle. It says, Dangote Refinery to reach full capacity in June as crude demand up by 2 million barrels per day. Now, we know that a fresh, a fresh crude, a fresh supply of crude was um, supplied to Dangote up to about 1 million barrel. Um, and right now, we're seeing the demand go up by 2 million barrel per day. What is your take on this and the impact that we could possibly see with this? Well, um, with respect to the refinery and Dangote refinery, I have my fingers crossed. You can see it. my finger is crossed on that particular on that particular matter. Um, I'm neither here nor there until we begin to see the actual production. Otherwise, most of the things we have seen are just promises and they are just um, PR being done. Um, let's see what impact it will have. Um, but, but like they said, sit down and look. Uh, let me approach, let me adopt the sit down and look and see what. Because if you do, if you track the number of stories that have come with respect to um, Dangote Refinery, uh, when it will start operation, when it will do this, when it will do that, this, you, you wonder as if um, that has actually taken it, its effect. Let's wait and see whether it will even affect the pump prices of petroleum products. Yeah. We are just on the on the on the 13th on the on the 12th of of, of, of January. I know how much I've spent in buying for it. Uh, even Nigerians are not even talking about that particular hardship. It's, it's, it's an untold hardship when you look at what you spend on 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 energy, energy to power your home, energy to power your business, and energy to power yourself to your various to your various places of work. So let's wait and see and see the impact of the Dangote. If our fingers are crossed, I'm tired of all this publicity stunt and all this PR that have been done for, 
for in order to take away our attention from the real challenges that people are facing. Even when you are even buying the fuel at six twenty, you still queue. You still yeah. queue. Um, the, you still queue to. You know that's it's it's it's. it's it's, 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 it's unfortunate. You are paying your money. You are, you are paying more your money for those services, and these services are available, and they are even selling it at exorbitant prices. That is someone that told you seven, nine months ago that this is the price you are going to pay. You see, that's not possible. People will do this. People will do that. Yet you are paying those prices, and then you still queue. You queue for 30, 10, 20, 30 minutes before you can have access to it, and they will be selling from one from. From, from one or two of their of their dispensing dispensing um, dispensing machine and you wonder are all other dispensing machine not working and you also wonder are there no regulatory body regulating this is it free for it's unfortunate but let's wait and see with with the issue of this petroleum sector and Dangote story at the rest of it I, my fingers are crossed like I said let's yeah. Let's see. More of it is more of PR than the reality of what we are facing on the ground. Let's see the impact it will have. Yeah, I, I, is it? Okay. I, th I think there's been a lot of story about this whole Dangote thing, so I can agree with you on that. Um, but I think one thing we're looking at is the accessibility to this product. Accessibility is one thing that most times you're driving past, um, you know, the expressway. And you're seeing a lot of filling stations being closed. Some of them, some of them are not working, and like you said, some of them maybe just two dispensers are working. But what is the impact that you would want to see on this? Uh, the, the reality of it is very simple. Um, you see, our energy powers the economy. That's the reality. Energy powers the economy. And if people don't have access to energy, how do you power the economy? The, is the energy that, look, if you work in the farmlands, your tractor that you are going to use um, to, to the, 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 the various machinery you are going to use are going to be powered by either fuel, by either PMS or diesel. Even for those that are involved in, in, in subsistence farming, um, majority of them, even in traditional farms, majority of our farmers are traditional farmers. They still use the old implements. But if you go to the rural area, how do they get to their farms? They go to their farms by driving by driving motorcycles. To, so if they drive, they drive motorcycles to their farm, and they are going to use PMS to, to drive their motorcycle to their farm. So if we don't get the energy sector, right, there's no way this economy can go. It's, it's the basic truth. When people talk about the glorious past that we had in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 50s, you know, energy, the energy sector was functional. The power sector was functional. And then, because once you, you can produce your agricultural products, you produce raw materials that your industrial, your manufacturing sector can use. Your manufacturing sector will produce goods, goods that will be used by your citizen, and the, the surplus will be exported. And then you earn foreign exchange and you grow the economy. The industry, the manufacturing sector are crying because they do, they can't even afford. They can't even the, the, the overhead cost for running their business is very, very high because they don't they can't even afford one. There's no power, there's no electricity from the generating or transmission or distribution company to the alternative energy source they have, which is diesel and petrol. They are exorbitant. They are even as exorbitant as they are, they are not easily accessible. And then how do you go to the economy? And somebody, one official of government will come around and will say in six months we'll turn around this economy. In seven months we'll turn around this economy. In nine months we'll turn around this economy. Or we'll come around and say, oh, this government is working, we're already trying. It's just the idea should just give us time. Look, no matter how you travel on the wrong track, you will not get your destination. The best thing for you to do is to turn backward and go back to where you are coming from. That's making progress. Progress sometimes is not going forward. Progress sometimes might mean just staying in one spot, or progress sometimes might just be you turning back and going back to the basics again. As far as I'm concerned, the route we are going through, we will not get to El Dorado, because until, I've said it over time, the first major transformation, transformational change that was done by God, according to the first documented evidence of creation, was light. Yeah. It was power. And God said, let there be light. And if you don't go back, that's the law of first measure. If you don't go back to that, this economy cannot grow. If government does not see it as a matter of priority, that we have to make serious investment in the energy sector, this economy will not grow. We'll just be playing to the gallery. Well, things are really difficult. Um, uh, 
the headline here, the major headline, which is the big story on page four and five of The Guardian, says, Renewed Hope Agenda After Honeymoon, Tales of War, Frustration, Trail, Tinubu's Policies. Uh, a case study is also a small headline down there saying, Female Banker Commits Suicide in Ikorodu Blames Economic Hardship. So we're just, we're, let's get your assessment, since you're not, um, uh, showing car to wait for one year. Let's get your assessment of the Tinubu's policies so far. What do you think about them? Yeah, and this is on the Guardian. The Guardian yeah. newspaper, not the Punch. Now, you know, um, the conception and the delivery of babies is nine months. And I've said it that we wait after nine months to begin to evaluate. This is, this is the eighth month of this particular administration. By the time we get to February, it will be nine months. And we begin to see. And from all indications, you could see that the, even the administration is bedeviled with a lot of corruption scandal. Just a small focus on on humanitarian, a Ministry of Humanitarian and Poverty Allocation. If you now not through the satellite on other sector, other sectors, you will have seen. We don't know what what is really what is really going on because nothing has really changed in government. What has really changed is the personnel of government. It's still the same party in power for the past eight, getting to nine years now that has still been power. What has changed is the leadership at the top and some of the leadership at the top. It's the same personnel they are still using. So it's the same template, it's, same, it's still the same program, it's still the same, the, same, the same mindset. And I've said it over time. What the president and his team needs to do and to understand is very simple. One, Nigeria is not Lagos State. The template that was used to run Lagos cannot be used to run Nigeria. Nigeria is a complex complex is in fact a multi-ethnic more complex than lagos so even though we say lagos is a mini is a mini nigeria the dynamics of nigeria is much more than that of that of lagos and so the ideas that were used in 1999 to 2007 in lagos cannot work in Nigeria. in fact in actual sense and uh, for you you know exactly i said for you to do the same thing the same manner and expect to get a different result is the beginning of insanity even once you think that the template of 1999 to 2007 in lagos will work in nigeria in 2023 moving forward, the person is wasting his or time. That's one. Then two, the president needs to understand, because if you look at, I've asked this question, I, um, I'm a critical stakeholder, it's my country, it's my country. Look at those that have been given responsibility, and I want to do a brief analysis of them. What did the president do after I left government? What did the president do after I left office in, 19, in 2007? He didn't went to, he didn't went to additional school, did he took any program on leadership? What else did he do other than getting too much more involved in politics? What else? What types of level of training or retraining or exposure or um, acquisition of new skills and new ideas that the president acquired after 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 I left office in 2007? Other than politicking, that's 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 on the president. Okay, you talk about the minister of what the coordinating minister for economy and the rest of it. Now you ask yourself. After he left as the Commissioner of Finance in 2007, uh, serving with the President, what else did he do? So for me, I think that they need, there's, an, there's a need for injection of fresh people, new people, younger people with fresh ideas. For, for me, I might be wrong, that's my own interpretation, and I'm entitled to it. The template they are using is a template they've used in Lagos in the past. And there's a saying in my local dialect, it is the hunting dog of today that knows how to do, go about the hunting expedition of today, not the hunting dog of the past. So I think that they need to sit down and understand that. That's the second one. The third aspect is very simple. They, they need to understand that one, elections have ended. Now it's time for governance. We don't need a knee-jack approach. If it will take us two, three months to plan a policy before we begin, to publicize the policy and implement policy, they need to put that in perspective and understand that elections have ended. You could, don't run public administration by propaganda. A lot of things, they want to be in the good side of, 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 of people. They want to manage public perception and public opinion. So they keep releasing statements, different types of statement, policy statement that they think that, okay, we bring the people on their side. No, you see, for you to solve a tough, for you to solve a problem, tough situation requires tough people. And tough people requires 
in, 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 in solving tough problems, you don't talk and talk and talk. You keep quiet. Silence is, is, is a critical factor in, in a dark street so that you can have access to having to getting feedback from everybody that you need to get feedback from and also to, to have the needed concentration in dealing with the particular problem. But I think that this government is too quick to respond to issues, to respond to public opinion, rather than focusing on what they want to do. And in this particular problem, they, need, they, they, need, they just need focus, clear-cut focus and clear-cut silence in, in quietness. There is strength in quietness, but not in releasing statement, making public statement left, right, and center, thinking that we are still in electionary campaign. Forgetting that electionary campaign has ended, we are now in public governance and it's a serious business of government. All right. Um, let's just take this last one from the Daily Independent. And um, it says, $800 million blocked funds. We may stop operating into Nigeria, foreign hell, airlines won. And they say the $61 million, $61 million payment is a drop in the ocean. And that is from the Daily Independent. What do you think about this? The foreign airlines are threatening to leave Nigeria. We've seen people, we've seen other companies leave the manufacturing sector. We're seeing them leave Nigeria. Our president is moving around looking for foreign investors, but the ones that we have here, we're not even able to, you know, cater for them and ensure that they have a sustainable environment to thrive. So what do you think about these foreign airlines? Because they're being owed about $800 million and what they've paid is just about 61, which is quite minute compared to, to the tune of $800 million. So what is your take on this on this one? We have an obligation. We have an obligation to fulfill all terms of credit. If you want people to have confidence in investing in your country, what well, I have a different approach with, with investment because I believe charity starts at home. Right. All the money they are owing, they should pay back the money. But if they want to go, I wouldn't mind if they should go. I need to give opportunities to local investors to invest. And our local operating airlines will be going through that route and invariably we grew we grew our our aviation sector from the local point of view, but the money they are owing them, they should go. And, and I see no reason why Nigeria couldn't plug it into whatever services these people are, 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 are providing. The Nigerians even prefer flying foreign airlines than, than, than local airlines. And instead of government and calling local airlines, so just imagine this amount of money being owed to local investors. Now, this mm. is the operation of funds. This fund is leaving Nigeria to put to other countries. That's the perspective. I'm nationalistic. In fact, I'm ultra-nationalistic when it comes to the issue of my nation. You can't blame me for that. That's the highest level of patriotism. Nigeria is the best country. Nigeria should have the best of everything. That's, that's my thinking. Nigeria first. So if they want to go, they can go. I don't mind about that. But pay them their money. But provide opportunities for local investors, local investors in the aviation sector. Whatever leverages you are giving these foreign operators. If it is not lucrative, they won't come here. They must, they must have been something which they are seeing. So why can't our local operators? I don't want to mention their name because they didn't pay any advert rate. <laughs> uh, not, so why can't we give such opportunities to our local operators too to invest in this sector? Give them, give them relief packages, give them palliatives, give them some version so that they can tap into it. And this eight hundred million dollars will be will be retained in Nigeria will not be repatriated to foreign countries. That's my take. I'm sorry if it offends some people, but that's 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 my thinking. And the president going abroad looking for foreign investors. The best investors to grow your economy are Nigerians because when they invest in this economy, the money will stay in Nigeria. Yeah. It will stabilize your it will stabilize your Naira. And once you have stability for Naira, the exchange rate of Naira comparable to other currency we grow. That's the best way we Nobody can help you to go to your economy. Look, Oba Sanjo traveled abroad. Jonathan traveled. Uh, uh, Yadwa yeah, traveled. Um, <coughs> Bwari traveled. Jimmy uh, is traveling. Adi Ajala traveled. Let them stay at home and concentrate on, their, on the job at home and encourage local investors. There are so many people. They encourage local investors. All the money they are using for the travel, let them invest that money. The president said, for the next 20 years, I'm not traveling abroad. I want to deal with Nigerians. Are you a businessman? Are you an entrepreneur? Are you interested in investment? Whatever regulatory measures that they have put in place to stop you from, from, from operating, we are going to, let me take advice and get input from you people. What can we do to turn this economy around, to make Nigeria, to invest in Nigeria, believe in Nigeria, and make Nigeria first? Hmm. 
All right, that's why we have to wrap it up on this segment. Thank you so much for joining <coughs> us and reviewing the paper. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. We've been speaking to Jide Jensen, who's the chief lecturer at Nigerian Institute of Journalism and was joining us here in Lagos State. We'll go on a quick break and when we return, we'll be talking about mapping your success in 2024. Please stay with us. <laughs>